In a lot of ways, it's incredibly difficult to talk about the early Puritan settlers of New England without talking about their theology and their ideologies, primarily because these beliefs govern so much of their day-to-day -day lives. This video serves as a very brief introduction to Puritan theology and ideology, as well as a little bit of a discussion of one of its central texts, John Winthrop's A Model of Christian Charity. Perhaps the most important aspect of Puritan ideology is Calvinist soteriology, which we could uh, call the doctrine of salvation, and a Calvinist view of providence, so his view of the protective care of God. Named after John Calvin, it's possible to break this system of beliefs down into five points. Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saints, or TULIP for short. Total depravity refers to an extreme version of original sin. According to Calvin, human nature is entirely corrupt as a result of the fall of man and our ejection from paradise. We are full of sin from the time of our birth, and there's really nothing that we can do about that. This doesn't necessarily mean that each and every one of us and everything that we do is pure evil, but it does refer to the notion that the fall was so serious that it affects the entirety of our person. Unconditional election refers to one of the more well-known tenets of Calvinism, uh, predestination. We could think of unconditional election this way. God doesn't foresee any situations where human action might induce him to say, hey, I want that person to go to heaven. Rather, our salvation rests entirely on God's will. Those chosen by God to go to heaven are referred to as the elect. Building on that, limited atonement refers to God's intention for sending Christ to die on the cross and is honestly one of the more controversial aspects of Calvinism. Because of unconditional election, we know that the only folks that get into heaven are the elect. But according to a lot of other theology, Christ's death was supposed to provide salvation for the entire human race. See the problem? So here, limited atonement acknowledges that Christ's death provided sufficient um, amounts of salvation for the entire human race. However, that's not what God intended. God intended that this salvation be provided only to the elect. The fourth point of Calvinism, irresistible grace, tells us that the grace of God, which in this case is directed only toward the elect, cannot be resisted and it cannot be earned. Eventually, those whom God has deemed worthy will overcome any resistances that they might have and they will live following the gospel. We could think of it this way. God created man through his will alone, and through his will alone will man be saved. We didn't ask to be created. We simply were. Likewise, we might not ask to be saved. We might even be living lives in opposition to Christian doctrine. But if God has chosen us as one of the elect, it is entirely out of our power to resist his decision. Finally, the fifth point of Calvinism, perseverance of the saints, tells us that only the elect can live righteously, and that once saved, they remain saved. For the elect, this group that God has handpicked for salvation, it is entirely impossible for them to lose that salvation. That's not to say that it's impossible for the elect to sin, as they most assuredly do. Uh, remember that whole total depravity bit. But what it, this does mean is that even though they are sinning, they're still living righteous lives. In a lot of ways, this is merely a natural consequence of predestination. God has chosen the elect for salvation independent of any virtues, and the elect will remain saved independent of any actions or vices. So, if it's not clear by now, the Puritans viewed themselves as a member of Calvin's elect, as those chosen by God for salvation, and really they took this quite literally. Breaking communion with the Anglican Church and establishing congregational models, they viewed themselves very much as the Jews fleeing uh, Egypt in the book of Exodus. This established the English colonies as a sort of new Jerusalem or a new Israel in their minds. 
And this also allowed the Puritans to view themselves as being on a mission to Christianize, colonize, and to dominate the pagans of North America and purge the heretics from the church. By mixing civil and the religious spheres, by, for example, placing ministers in positions of power, they attempted to purify both the church and the greater society and culture by stripping away frivolity and excess. The New England Puritans were the most radical here, uh, disapproving of celebrations including Christmas, birthdays, and the like. The New England Puritans also went without secular entertainment like plays, and they only enjoyed a moderate drinking of alcohol. Their clothes were simple. They were serious, practical, and modest. One of the most important figures in early Puritan society was John Winthrop. The governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony several times, he was a relatively authoritarian leader with theocratic impulses, meaning that he let uh, his religious views influence the way that he governed. Winthrop justifies his view in his life and letters when he says, if we should change from a mixed aristocracy to mere democracy, first, we should have no warrant in scripture for it, for there was no such government in Israel. A democracy is, amongst civil nations, accounted the meanest and worst of all forms of government. To allow it would be a manifest breach of the fifth commandment. Perhaps the most important, or at least the most enduring piece of Winthrop's work, is a sermon delivered in 1630, either on board or immediately before departing England on the Arbella. This sermon, a model of Christian charity is one of the more important texts to consider when thinking not only about Puritan theology and ideology, but also for thinking about American identity. Winthrop begins his sermon by stating that God Almighty in his most holy and wisest providence has so disposed of the condition of mankind as in all times some must be rich, some poor, some high and eminent in power and dignity, others mean and in subjection. Winthrop then states that there are three reasons why God has decreed inequalities by making people have different positions from one another. The first, he says, is to conform with the differences throughout the natural world. He discusses how God wishes to give his gifts to mankind um, by distributing them through mankind quote, dispensing his gifts by man to, or to man by man. The second reason is to show what role the Holy Spirit plays in the lives of mankind. First, by restraining evil, quote, so that the rich and mighty should not eat up the poor, nor the poor and despised rise up against their superiors and shake off their yoke, end quote. Additionally, by showing God's grace through the lives of Christians, quote, as in the great ones, their love, mercy, gentleness, temperance, etc., and in the poor and inferior sort, their faith, patience, obedience, etc. End the quote. The third reason Winthrop gives for God's decreeing inequalities amongst man is to foster an interdependence among mankind. He says that, quote, every man might have need of other, and from hence they might be all knit more nearly together in the bonds of brotherly affection, end quote. Winthrop explains that wealth should not be purely for the benefit of the rich, but, quote, for the glory of his creator and the common good of the creature, man. Afterward, Winthrop moves on to explaining that, quote, there are two rules by which we are to walk towards another, justice and mercy. He claims that these two rules should govern all of a community's interactions and that they should be observed by both the rich and the poor since both groups occasionally need both justice and mercy. He then says that these two rules can be summarized in a single overriding law. Man is, quote, commanded to love his neighbor as himself. And while he goes on to acknowledge that a man is responsible for his own well-being and that of his family, he says that the overriding principle should be that if thou lovest God, thou must help thy brother. 
Now, this bond of love, according to Winthrop, was supposed to unite the group as they traveled to America to build a new society based on this love. He says, quote, through a special overvaluing providence and more than ordinary approbation of the churches of Christ, they were to, quote, seek out a place of cohabitation and consortship under a due form of government, both civil and ecclesiastical. Because they were the elect, it was their duty to God to seek out a place where they could live together in civil and religious harmony. Winthrop tells his listeners that, quote, we are entered into a covenant for him and his work. We have taken out a commission. The Lord hath given us leave to draw our own articles. However, Winthrop then warns his listeners that even though their work is sanctioned by God, they must not fail. He says, If we shall neglect the observation of these articles, which are the ends we have propounded, and dissembling with our God shall fall to embrace this present world and prosecute our carnal intentions, seeking great things for ourselves and our posterity, the Lord will surely break out in wrath against us, be revenged of such a perjured people, and make us know the price of the breach of such a covenant. Winthrop concludes uh, that if those aboard the Arbella can commit themselves to brotherly love and unity, they can lay the foundations for a new community that will become a model for others to follow. He says, We shall find that God of Israel is among us, when ten of us shall be able to resist a thousand of our enemies, when he shall make us a praise and glory that men shall say of succeeding plantations, the Lord make it like that of New England. For we must consider that we shall be as a shining city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in his work we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword through the world. Now, it's this last part that really sticks with me, this image of the city on a hill, because in so many ways, it sets the tone for what would eventually become the idea of American exceptionalism. Ronald Reagan was fond of quoting Winthrop in his speeches, touting America's position as an example to the world. And it's an idea that runs deep in our culture. There are a lot of other things that Winthrop discusses here in this sermon that I'm not entirely sure that we've remembered quite as well. <laughs>